school hour here at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. Let's all stand together. We'll sing the first verse of hymn number 219. Grace, tis a charming sound. 219. Just first one. <clears throat> Thank you this morning for the beautiful day that you've blessed us with, and I ask that you would be with us in our Sunday school hour. I pray that you would gift each teacher with the special ability to communicate the truth, and I ask that you would help us as we are learners and listeners, God, to be able to answer the question of how we can live for Jesus in light of what we've heard. And I just thank you for this all. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated if you're in the adult class, and teens are in my class, and Mrs. Price is in the back. All right, all right, go, go with Mama. I can't teach the babies. Right over here. She's gonna go teach. She's gonna go teach the babies. And Aria is gonna go teach the babies. <laughs> Get them started young. All right. I don't know why I have my hymn book open. We don't need that at least for the next hour. Genesis 4. Continuing our series, Why Are We Fundamental? We've been looking at a number of topics. We'll be finishing up this series next week. There are handouts on the back table, as well as the PowerPoint up here on the right-hand screen. Genesis 4 is where we're going to begin this morning. Genesis 4. Let's pray and ask God for his help, and we will begin looking at the blood atonement. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together to worship you this morning. God, I pray you would speak to all of our hearts concerning the topic of the blood of atonement as part of why we are fundamental. Help us, Lord, to understand the reason the blood atonement is so important and so vital and critical to why we are indeed fundamental. Help us to learn the truth. Help me to present your word clearly this morning. We ask in Jesus for Jesus' sake. Amen. Genesis 4. I'm going to start reading verse 1. Bible says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she, gained, and she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. 
The Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt not thou be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. I'm actually going to read on a little bit more. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. The Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? He said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Stop right there. I trust many of you, the rest of us, are familiar with the passage. So I'm going to be off screen back and forth. There we are. So I'm going to be, be off-camera back and forth. But the introduction on the... I have handouts for everybody. Um, and also we also have the PowerPoint up here. Uh, the attack on the doctrine of the blood atonement, it's not new. This is not some new thing that's only recently come out in the last 30, 40 years. This goes all the way back. And it's not something that's been around since, since Christ died. It goes all the way back to Cain and Abel. And the problem, the, the, now Jesus shed his blood because God's justice demanded it. You can see why, and let's, we can see why, just go turn, turn back a page or two in your Bibles, depending on how much commentary you have in there, to Genesis 3. There's handouts on the back table if you're just walking in. Genesis 3. I'm going to start reading, in, it looks like verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Note this, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now verses 20 and 21. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins, and clothe them. God's justice demanded a blood atonement for, for sin. You can also read about, we can also, we'll also continue to look at this throughout this, this morning. But turn with me to, uh, you wanna, you're probably going to want to keep a finger in Genesis because we'll be going back to there. But turn with me to Leviticus uh, 17. I'll read verse 11 from Leviticus 17. The Bible says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. Note this, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Jesus sacrificed himself as our substitute because he loved us. Now you can go back to uh, Genesis 2. I'm going to start reading in verse 15. The Lord God took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. But yet, did man, did man die physically? No. You see that in Genesis 3, when you, re, you can read about, the, uh, read about the fall of man. We talked about that. I think we talked about that pretty ad nauseum last week, so I don't believe we need, have any... And I trust enough of us are familiar with the passage, we don't need to go back and look at it. But you see the fall of man, how uh, that the, the serpent uh, was able to get Eve to partake, and then, Adam part, and then Adam partook, and thus the fall of man, and the curse of, and then how sin was then therefore imputed 
onto man and uh, to of course to Adam and then to man onto mankind. But yet, Christ sacrificed Himself, being our substitute. We can die for our sins. We can choose to die for our sins. What do you have to do to die for your own sin? Absolutely nothing. You can live just live life as you want and die and choose to die for your own sin. Or you can place your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and have his blood atone for your sin. He did that because he loved us. Did he have to? No. He did that because he loved us. Look at uh, Romans. Actually, let's go to Isaiah 53 before we go to uh, Romans. We'll try to go in order of... Uh, Cannot, we'll try to go in canonical order, just so that way we're not flipping through as much, uh, pages as quick here. Isaiah 53. I'm going to read verse 5, but then we're going to read verses 10 through 12. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the, of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. This, of course, is a reference to Christ. Uh, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. All right, furthermore, Romans 5. I trust many of us are familiar with this passage. Romans 5, verse 6. The Bible says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Note this, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul made the perfect, uh, Paul gave a great illustration. He said in verse 7, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, and yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. There are many out there who put their lives on the line for good for good pe for people who are good, quote, and I'm gonna use that term loosely, of course, because there are none there are no good people. They're only sinners. And there are many people who throw who put their lives out on the line. Even random strangers put their lives out there on the line for to to save others. You read about it all the time. But yet, verse 8, God commended his love toward us. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet in our own sin, could not save ourselves, Christ died for us. I trust all of us are familiar with John 3.16. We're not going to need to turn there. How about 2 Corinthians 5? Last verse of 2 Corinthians 5. Paul made this argument. He said, For he had made him, that is, for God had made him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Okay, I'm going to move on to the uh, sl uh, slideshow here. All right, uh, Roman numeral one. Jesus' sacrifice 
satisfied God's justice. The sacrifice of Christ satisfied God's justice. We read Isaiah 53 already, so let's go to 1 John. By the way, I do not have a, a clock here, so if somebody could put, put up uh, three fingers when there's three minutes left in the class. At 1040, if, you, if somebody just puts up a three, I'll know that I'll know there's three minutes left. Uh, it's not 1040 yet, sir. <laughs> Maybe 1040 somewhere else in the world, but it's not 1040 here in the Eastern time zone. First John. I'm going to read verse 1, context, and then verse 2. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father... Jesus Christ the righteous, but know what he says about, about Christ. Verse 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Christ did not just die for those who would become righteous. Christ did not just die for a handful of select people. He died for every person. And his sacrifice satisfied God's justice. Now, the substitutionary sacrificial system was all God's idea. Let's read on in our... I think we've looked at a handful of these packa pa uh, packages, yeah, passages already. We've read a handful of these passages, so let's go to let's go back to Genesis three, and we'll go we'll read a few of these. The early chapters of Genesis so foundational to get grasping this. Verse fifteen: and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Verse 21, unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. When God made Adam and Eve these coats, he had to sacrifice animal skin to make them clothing. And in so doing, it first established the sacrificial system. That is, that in order for them to be clothed, blood had to be shed. And in so doing, set up the Old Testament sacrificial system that would ultimately lead to the ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb of God coming to take our place and die for sin to ultimately atone. How about uh, Genesis 4? We read this earlier, but let's read, uh, let's read, some, of it. Let's read some of this again. So Abel was a... Uh, let's, uh, verse 2. And she again bears brother Abel. So Cain and Abel are now on the scene. Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of ground. In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. We'll stop there for a second. Now, I'm sure Cain made this look good. Brought the best fruit basket and everything of the ground, everything that he worked hard for. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. Note this, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. Stop there for just a second. Abel's up. Now, looking at the outside, be, say you're an outsider to this, and we don't know the real reason, and you don't, and you might not be familiar with the reason why Cain's offering was rejected, and even though it looked beautiful, as opposed to Abel's offering, which was bloody, but yet was accepted. To the outside world, to the outside world, to the outside eye, 
You may think, why? Why would that be the case? Yet you can see why the case is. God demanded the blood sacrifice. Because without, according to what we see later on in the scripture, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Not only that, blood, blood had to be shed. Okay, how about Genesis 8? Fifteen to twenty-one. Let's uh, start at fifteen. The Bible says, Genesis eight fifteen, and God spake unto Noah, saying, uh, "Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife, and thy sons and thy sons' wives of thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is of thee, of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth." And Noah went forth, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord. Note this, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more any more every living thing as I have done. The sacrifice of the Noah's sacrifice here continued and therefore or essentially here reestablished the substitutionary sacrifice system. The Old Testament, Leviticus in particular, is chock full of the sac of sacrifices of animals to atone for sin, ultimately pointing the picture to Jesus Christ and his atonement. Now, why is death required to pay for sin? Well, God established that as a requirement. Go back to Genesis. Actually, I think we were still there. We never left. <clears throat> the Lord God took the man and put... This is uh, Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But note verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, did Adam and Eve die physically? No. They did die spiritually, though. And so because of that, is the sin curse is passed on to all mankind. Mankind is born physically, but is dead spiritually. Because mankind is born physically but dead spiritually, we must, we must therefore come to the point, at some point during our physical lives, we must come to the realization that we are sinners, cannot save ourselves, and must place our trust in Jesus Christ as the atonement to be, to be born spiritually. If you're born once, you can die twice. Because you can die physically, and you die spiritually. If you're only born once. But if you're born twice, physically and spiritually, guess what's going to happen? You're only going to die once. You might only die physically. And not only that, there might be some people that will be raptured and never taste a physical death. But spiritual death is required to pay for sin because God established that as a requirement. And death means separation. What do you say in verse 17? But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. But not only that, that death meant a separation. When Adam and Eve sinned, they, they were driven out of the uh, Garden of Eden. You read about that in Genesis 3, at the very end of Genesis 3. Why was that? 
because God had to separate because of the sin. There was now, there was now a divide between God and man. God cannot have sin in his presence. Why did God turn his back on his son when Christ died for our sin? Because he could not look upon sin. That's why Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because Jesus at that point was taken on him all the sin of all the world. Death means separation. Okay. Uh, Roman numeral two. Jesus' sacrifice demonstrated God's love for mankind. Jesus' sacrifice demonstrated God's love for mankind. We looked at this earlier, but let's look at it again. Romans 5. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. While, while we were yet sinners, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a powerful statement. What a meaningful thing. Now, God was not obligated to rescue mankind. Did God have to send his son to die for us? No. Absolutely not. God was not obligated to rescue mankind. Because mankind had sinned. They had fallen short. They fell away from God. And so we could, we also fell away from God, and God, and God, and God could very much have chosen to, to not send His Son to die for us, but He did that because He loved us. He loved His creation. He loved us so much that He sent Christ to die for us. God provided everything necessary for reconciliation. We we read, we read 2 Corinthians five twenty one, but let's go back there again. Let's actually read verses 18 through the end of the chapter of 2 Corinthians 5, because we're going to be looking at this again in uh, letter C under Roman numeral 2. Let's start reading in verse 18. In all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And hath given to us the, me the, the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he provided everything necessary for reconciliation. What was necessary for reconciliation? The death of Christ. The death. Death. Who was the avenue for death? Christ. Christ was the avenue of death. And he had to be the avenue of death because it needed a perfect sacrifice. In the Old Testament, we'll read about this, we're getting there, letter A, under Roman rule three, is it something we're gonna read now, the substitute had to be holy, had to be without blemish. Let's, we'll go there. That's gonna, be, that's gonna be one of the next things we'll be looking at. To be reconciled to God, Christ had to die. Not only that, and all we had to do 
To be reconciled to God was to believe on Christ. To believe that we are lost, to believe that we could not save ourselves, and to place our trust in Jesus Christ who died for us. We believe that by faith, born again. Or reconciled to God. God initiates and maintains a reconcili reconciliatory pursuit. Let me see. I did not... I see this passage. Yeah, um, Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. I believe Paul quoted from, this, from parts of this passage in Romans. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. But note what he says in verse 3. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. None do good. None seek after God. When we first, when we're first into this earth, are we seeking God? No. Usually we're just seeking for something to eat or seeking for our mother or seeking for our father. We don't seek after God right away. And later on in life, we just move on, especially if we're not, if some of us didn't grow up in a Christian home and aren't taught the Bible and aren't taught about God and about the reason Christ came to the earth. We grow on. We continue in sin. We live our lives just haphazardly out there. The only way we're reconciled to God when somebody tells us, hey, Christ died for you. Do you know Christ as your savior? Do you know what Christ did? You get to think about it, and then you realize, and at some point, a lot of us, all of us have come to the realization that, you know what? Christ did die for me. And I have a choice here. I have a choice to make. And the choice is that I can Acknowledge that, yes, I'm a sinner, and yes, I fall short, and yes, I need Jesus Christ to save me. Provided everything necessary. He was not obligated to rescue mankind, but did so, and not only that, he provided everything necessary for, me, for reconciliation. And there's only one person who could ever meet the demands of God's just decree, and, yet, and, and also provide himself a perfect substitute for the whole of mankind. Go with me to 1 Timothy 2. So Roman numeral three. Only Jesus could ever meet the demands of God's just decree while providing himself a perfect substitute for the whole of mankind. First Timothy two. I actually want to start reading in verse one. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Note what he says on further on, verse 30. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Note this. Who will have some, wait, no. It's not the word some in my Bible. All. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. One God, one mediator between God and men. Only one person could meet that demand. And that was Jesus Christ. So note this. The, the substitute had to be two things. The substitute had to be holy, and the substitute had to be equal. Let's look at how the substitute having to be holy. Go to Exodus 12. This would be the Passover. Substitute had to be holy. 
The Lord speak unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye all unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them a, every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. If the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Now, what, note verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Stop there. If a lamb had a blemish, why was it not to be used as a sacrifice? Was Christ, if Christ had blemish on him, could he be our substitute? He could not. So this here is a actual, an, an illustration. This is an illustration for us of what Christ was, of what Christ would be, of what Christ is for us. Lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the, from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it unto the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. They shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house wherein they shall eat it. They shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat none of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire. His head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain till the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. Note this, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, will smite all, all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Substitute had to be holy. Had to be a lamb without blemish. Christ was the lamb without blemish. Let's read on some more. Leviticus chapter 9. Leviticus 9. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said unto Aaron, Take thee a young calf for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. And unto the children of Israel thou shalt speak, saying, Take ye a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and a calf of the lamb, both of the first year, without blemish for a burnt offering. At these, all, these, all these sacrifices, all these offerings to the Lord, they had to be without blemish. How about Leviticus 14, verse 10? And on the eighth day, he shall take two he lambs, guess what? Without blemish. And one ewe lamb of the first year, without blemish. And three tenth deals of fine flour for a meat offering mingled with oil and one log of oil. Substitute had to be holy. Leviticus 22. We can read it again, verses uh, 17 and following. This is this is a big reason why we don't use they, they use blemished animals. Note this, Leviticus 22. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, and unto all the children of Israel, and say unto them, Whatsoever he be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers in Israel, that will offer his oblation for all his vows, 
and for all his free will offerings, which they will offer unto the Lord for a burnt offering. Ye shall offer at your own will a male without blemish of the bees, of the sheep, or of the goats. But whatsoever hath a blemish, that shall ye not offer, for it shall not be acceptable for you. The sacrifice had to have had, had to be perfect, had to be no without blemish. And whosoever offereth a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow or a free will offering in bees or sheep, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein. Blind or broken or maimed or having a wen or scurvy or scab, ye shall not offer these unto the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them upon the altar unto the Lord. Either a bullock or a lamb that hath anything superfluous or lacking in his parts that thou mayest offer for a free will offering, but for a vow it shall not be accepted. Ye shall not offer unto the Lord that which is bruised or crushed or broken or cut, uh, neither shall you make any offering thereof in your land. Neither from a stranger's hand shall ye offer the bread of your God of any of these, because their corruption is in them, and blemishes be in them, they shall not be accepted for you. So there is a reason there. Do you have a... Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Last, um, last point we'll get to this morning. The substitute had to be equal. Go to Hebrews 10. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Substitute had to be equal. So not only the substitutes have to be holy, substitute had to be equal. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. God had no pleasure with the Old Testament sacrificial system. Because the ultimate, but, the, but he wanted everyone to get the ultimate picture, which was that these sacrifices that were without blemish, they were lambs without blemish, would ultimately point them to the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, going to be a perfect lamb without blemish, and ultimately going to the cross of Calvary to die for your sins and mine. I believe there's, a, it, it's not in your handout, but there is a really illustrative picture here up on the screen. It said, The Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. I believe that's a quote from Isaiah 53. There's the uh, picture of the two malefactors and, of course, Christ in the middle. The one malefactor rejected Christ, so therefore he had sin on him and in him. He had no hope, and he was without God. The other malefactor had sin in him, but not on him. When in Luke uh, 23 is the passage of the malefactor who came to who came to Christ, essentially he came to Christ as his savior. When he said, and said, Lord, remember, said this man had done nothing amiss. We deserve what we what we we deserve to be up here. We deserve this, but Christ did not. He said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And then Christ told him, uh, Truly, this day you be with me in paradise. Loose paraphrase. And then, of course, Jesus, the hope of the world, sin on him, but not in him. So a nice little uh, picture there. Yeah, you go ahead and uh, believe that's not that's not copyrighted. <laughs> Char uh, Char I'm sure Charlie wouldn't use things that are copyrighted. 
Um, does anybody have any questions about the material we covered this morning? It's pretty, uh, pretty basic, but it's very fundamental to get this. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There is no hope for us. There's no hope for you or I. We're lost. We're dead in our sins and trespasses. Can't be reconciled to God. We just live life, and then we die. We spend eternity in hell. But thank God for his son, for his sacrifice. Let's thank God for what we learned this morning. We'll pray for the Sunday morning service that God will speak to our hearts. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together to learn about your son and about his substitution for sin by dying on the cross for us. Thank you for that avenue of reconciliation. Thank you for your son. I pray for the Sunday morning service that you would speak to our hearts as we open your word again. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. You're dismissed. Service will begin in about 15 minutes.